So ladies, we're going to introduce uh, enzymes and energy, okay? Very, very important topic. You'll be doing your next lab on Friday, and it's going to be in regards to enzymes and energy. All right, so we're going to introduce, like today, tomorrow, today we'll talk about an introduction. Tomorrow, you know, do you have a quiz tomorrow, so it won't take the whole period. Tomorrow we'll continue with enzymes and energy, okay? Um, all right, so you have, yeah, yes, I'm recording this, yes. And now that's in the recording. The fact that I said I'm recording is in the recording. If you're loud enough, yes, it will pick you up. Yes, yes, Kimberly Douglas, it will pick you up. Okay, so there's a, there's a bunch of stuff in your PowerPoint that I'm not going to go over. Stuff that you could just read about, like what energy is, different types of energy, okay? Like potential versus kinetic. Um, so I'm not going to go over uh, a lot of this stuff because it's just stuff that you could read about. Okay. Uh, maybe this one's kind of important. Energy cannot be created or destroyed. Uh, first law of thermodynamic. Energy can be only converted from one form into another. You may have learned about that uh, a long time ago. Uh, so here's a picture of bioluminescence. This is a chemical energy being converted into light energy. Uh, kind of the opposite, you know, what happens with plants, they convert light energy into chemical energy, and we'll talk about that in photosynthesis. Okay? But there, here, here's an important concept that you might not be uh, very familiar with that is uh, important. To entropy. Uh, entropy is an important concept. It's a measurement of randomness. If something has very high entropy, it's more disorganized. If something has very low entropy, it's more organized. So, does this show you, is this an image of something that has high entropy or low entropy? Does it look organized or disorganized? It looks very organized, so that would be low entropy, okay? Something that is very disorganized would have high entropy. This is an important concept, you'll see why it's important as we go through this, okay? Um, so again, there's some stuff here about um, free energy. You guys can, uh, you can just read about that on your own. Uh, I will point out this. Sometimes you'll see this in a book. This delta G symbol right over here. This refers to uh, a reaction. Now, you may have heard about uh, exergonic versus endergonic reactions in chemistry. Um, if something, ha if a reaction has a negative value, that means it's going to release energy. If something has a positive value, that means it's going to absorb energy. Okay? And you'll see that as we go through this uh, presentation. So, for example, glucose plus oxygen give you carbon dioxide and water. Uh, the reaction, so here are the reactions over here. These are the reactants. Okay, so... Uh, and you can see when the reaction proceeds, you have a negative delta G value. This means that it's what? Exergonic or endergonic? It means exergonic. Now, what does that mean? That means that the overall reaction is releasing energy. Okay? That the products have less energy than their reactants. So they're losing energy. They're releasing it. Whereas the, this is the opposite reaction, carbon dioxide and water becoming glucose and oxygen. You can see that requires energy input. There's a plus value, so it's energy input. That's an endergonic reaction. These are two, not, I'm going to explain that. We're going to be looking at respiration and photosynthesis, okay? And it's quite complicated. So this, this reaction over here, this is the, like, oops, sorry. This reaction summarizes uh, respiration, cellular respiration, but it's not cellular respiration. You'll see, it's not cellular respiration. It summarizes it, because we know we take sugar, and we take oxygen, and we break it down, and we release water and carbon dioxide. And when we do that, we release energy, because we need the energy to move, for instance. The reaction below, is the opposite, the complementary reaction, 
again, it's not the reaction, it's, because you'll see, which is, by the way, photosynthesis. It's not photosynthesis, because you'll see photosynthesis is way more complicated than this reaction of carbon dioxide in the water giving you glucose and oxygen. But if we just think of it from a simple point of view, you can see that photosynthesis is a reaction that absorbs energy. Respiration is a reaction that releases energy. That's why you eat, because you have to release the energy from the food. Whereas plants absorb energy from sunlight to make food. Okay? So, exergonic versus endergonic. An exergonic reaction, we said, releases energy. So, here's an example of a, this is a bombardier beetle. It defends itself by, uh, through a decomposition of hydrogen peroxide. And the reaction is very violent, very exergonic, releases a lot of energy. Uh, and this beetle will defend itself through this reaction. Highly exergonic. Now, don't be confused, because you may have heard of the term exothermic. How many of you guys done great ball chemistry? Okay, so you, you've heard of exothermic versus endothermic? Okay, what's an exothermic reaction? Releases heat, right? An endothermic is something that absorbs heat. Now, you may think, okay, is that the same, like, is an exothermic the same as an exergonic? They're similar. Because they both release something, right? An exothermic releases heat, an exergonic releases energy. But is all energy heat? No. You can release energy in some other form. Okay? So an exergonic reaction does not need to be an exothermic reaction. I'll give me an example. Look at this picture here. Uh, on the left, you see... Over here, so on the left over here, what do you see? You see, so these are molecules. I don't know what they are, molecules or something. And if I compare the picture on the left versus the picture on the right, in which picture are the molecules more organized, and in which picture are they more randomly distributed? Which one? Which one looks random? Which one looks like it's organized? Like, so if it's organized, imagine like, you know, think of your room, right? If your room was not organized, you would expect to see stuff everywhere. But if you go in your room and you see clothing nice and piled up and books nicely piled up, then we know that it's organized. And for it to be organized, someone had to do what? Had to put in some energy to do that. So which of these two pictures represents? Highly organized. Yep, the one on the left. So this one over here, right? This one represents high, uh, highly organized. So if it's highly organized, then it has low entropy. Because entropy refers to randomness. This has high entropy because it's not organized. It's randomly distributed, right? Now, why does this represent, like how does this represent energy? So we can think of a, like a reaction. We normally think of a reaction that releases energy as something that releases heat energy, but it doesn't have to release heat energy. An exergonic reaction does not have to be exothermic. It just has to release energy. So how are we releasing energy here? What's going on? So you're going to see this when we get to respiration and photosynthesis. So I'm going to give you a visual right now, okay? I want you to imagine that in the middle, like right over here, we put some sort of a fan. So I'm gonna I'm gonna try to draw a fan, okay? Draw a fan right here. So I'm gonna draw a fan. So here's my fan. Okay. It's like a windmill. Think of it as a windmill, okay? Think of it as a windmill. I'm gonna draw one on the other side too. So here's my windmill. Alright? Now, you can see in the diagram that there's space so this might be some membrane and I can see that there's space so these molecules can actually slide through so what would happen if we put like a little machine that could spin in this setup 
what happened? And let's imagine we blocked off all of these doors, so they can't go this way, and they can't go this way. We block, and we left this open right over here. So what would happen? The particles would move through. What would happen to this wheel? What would it start doing? It would start what? It would start to turn, right? This is how a, a water mill works, or a windmill, right? Water flows through it, or wind passes through the mill, and it causes the mill to what? To spin, right? Because in, the, in that case, the water and the wind is coming from one side and moving to the other side, right? What if we did the same experiment on this side over here? Imagine we blocked off everything except for one little opening. So there's an opening right over here. We put this w uh, little windmill or whatever this is, a little tiny motor. And the particles, we know particles are going to move. Well, what happened on this side? Would this wheel spin? The answer is no. Why? Why wouldn't it spin? Well, because on this side, what do you, where are all the particles on this side? They're on the left. And according to diffusion, they're all going to want to move which way? To the right until what? They're going to want to move this way until what? Until we reach, what's that word? Equal, equilibrium. Okay, diffusion, remember, move from a high concentration to a low concentration. So on the left, when the particles move from a high concentration below, that little wheel is going to spin. So let me ask you a simple question. If the wheel is spinning, does it gain energy? It does. Because if the wheel is moving, that means it has what? It has energy, right? Where would the energy have come from? Because according to the laws of thermodynamics, you can't just create energy. Where do you think the energy came from? The movement of what? The molecules from a high concentration to a low concentration. Why does that not happen on the right side though? What? On the right side, the molecules are what? Organized or disorganized? They're disorganized. They're all over the place. They have very high entropy. So they're not going to move to one side, right? They're going to move around, but, you know, it, there's not going to be a net movement to one side. So that wheel is not going to spin. This, by the way, this is how bacteria flagella works. The bacteria flagella, basically you have a, a membrane. You have this motor that acts like a little uh, uh, wheel, and it's attached to a uh, flagella. So a little, you know, flagella is basically a tail. And as molecules move from one side to the other side of the motor, it spins, and the flagella spins, and the bacteria can swim away. So you'll see when we look at um, cellular respiration and photosynthesis, how when molecules are on one side of a membrane, we can get energy out of it. Okay? Well, we'll talk more about that when we get to respiration and uh, photosynthesis. Okay, so we talked about exergonic versus endergonic. So here's a picture. An exergonic reaction, the reactants have more energy than the products. So we can see that we release energy. So that would be like overall respiration, solid respiration. Whereas endergonic, we absorb energy because the products have more energy. So that would be something like photosynthesis. Okay. Now, when we release energy, uh, or when we absorb it, a very important molecule that is involved in this is called ATP. Uh, this is ATP over here. ATP, we looked at it before. It's a modified nucleotide, right? We can see it's got ribose. We got the adenine base, and we got phosphate. When it has three phosphate, it's fully charged. So it has a lot of energy. When it becomes ADP, one of the phosphate over here is removed. So this represents a lower energy molecule. This molecule has less energy than this one. So the idea is simple. 
If you want to make ATP, you have to add energy to it. Now, a lot of people look at this diagram and they don't, they don't read it correctly. This diagram is a little bit tricky. So, I'm going to ask you guys this question. Uh, to make ATP, so you see ATP over here? Right here is ATP. And on this side is what? ADP. You go, I believe you go through about your, and I could be wrong with the numbers, but it's a significant amount, like your body weight of ATP a day. You regenerate it. It goes from ATP to ADP, back to ATP. I like to think of it as like your cell phone battery. You know, it charges it, then you, you use it, so the battery goes low, then you charge it again, then you use it up, then it goes low, and you charge it again. So ATP is like your full battery. ADP is like your battery that's on low. According to this diagram, to make ATP, is it an exergonic or endergonic reaction? What do you think? Emily? It looks like a, a, it looks like um, it looks like an exergonic reaction, but that's not how you read this chart. This chart is a little bit tricky to read. I find I realized over the years the students always think that they, they interpret the chart a little bit differently. What this chart is saying is that to make ATP, right? Now ATP itself is not an exergonic reaction. It's an endergonic reaction. Because look, which one has more energy? ATP or ADP? So this has more energy, right? So if it has more energy than this one, if this one has lower energy, that means this one has to have absorbed energy, right? So that means that it had to have undergone an endergonic reaction, had to absorb energy. What this chart is saying is something really important. In, in biology, when you want one reaction to do something, you need to connect it to another reaction that does the opposite. So I want you to think of an analogy, okay? If I need someone, if I have a person who needs money, I need to connect them with someone who needs to give them money, right? Otherwise, what's going to happen? You need money, and you don't get connected with someone who can give you money, then you're always going to be stuck with you needing money, right? So think of ATP. ATP is something that needs energy. We need to connect it to a reaction that's going to what? Release energy. So what this chart is showing you is something called a coupled reaction. So a reaction that will release energy will be connected to a reaction that absorbs energy. So when we go from ADP to ATP, that's an endergonic reaction which must be connected to an exergonic reaction. So when you eat and you break down the food and you release the energy from your food, what kind of reaction would that be? Jerusha, you're releasing energy from your food. Exer or endergonic? It'd be exergonic. One of the things that happens is we connect it to the formation of ATP, which is an endergonic reaction. So why do we make ATP? Why do we need to make molecules that store energy? Can you think of a reaction in your body that requires energy? Well, pretty much any reaction will require energy. Movement, thinking, right? Uh, like these are, you know, these are examples of uh, things that would require energy. So to move, we need energy input. Where do you think the energy comes from? It's the breakdown of ATP. As ATP gets converted back to uh, ADP, it's an exergonic reaction. It releases energy. So we're going to connect it to a reaction that requires energy. Movement requires energy. If I want to make insulin, it requires energy. Insulin would be an endergonic reaction. If I want to make muscle, it's going to be, uh, sorry, if I want to move, it's going to require energy. Even making muscle requires energy. So anything that requires energy 
which is endergonic, would have to be connected to an extragonic reaction. Okay, so that's what this, this chart is uh, going over. Um, and you can see here, so as we go from uh, ATP to ADP, that's an exergonic reaction. We can see it releases, there's a negative value, it releases energy. So if we go the other way, ADP and P to become ATP, you would expect it to absorb energy, because that would be endergonic. Now, what drives the chemistry in your body, though? What drives the chemistry in your body? Because these are chemical reactions we're talking about, right? Endergonic reactions, exergonic reactions. These are all chemical reactions. What drives these reactions? What do you think it is? It's a hint. It's on the screen. Enzymes. Okay? Enzymes. Now, what are enzymes? These are catalysts. Okay? Catalyst is something that will speed up a reaction. So let me show you uh, a little animation. Okay? So, um, again, it's an animation, so I don't know how seriously you want to take these. So this is a reaction without an enzyme. So you may have studied this in chemistry. For a reaction to happen, two molecules need to meet up. So here's a reaction between this purple dot, whatever that is, and this red square. And you can see that they have to collide. This is called the molecular collision theory. Okay, Molecules have to collide in a reaction. Otherwise, if they don't meet, if two molecules do not meet, they won't react. So an enzyme will just make it happen faster. An enzyme will speed up a reaction, and uh, so therefore it's a catalyst. Okay, it's a biological catalyst, so it's organic. It's mostly going to be protein. Okay, not always, but it's mostly protein. And what they do? How do they speed up a reaction? Well, they lower the activation energy. So look at this graph here. The activation energy refers to the amount of energy that has to go in into a reaction to make it go, right, to make it happen. So, for example, if I take sugar and I leave it on my desk and it's surrounded by air, there's oxygen in the air. But what happens is the, the oxygen collides with the sugar, but nothing happens because there's not enough energy. If you go back to this, this says that if I take some sugar and I add oxygen to it, I will get a reaction. Well, it depends. If I leave it on my desk and I leave up, I'm sure you've all left sugar on your desk and you have people over. Do you see it like do anything? It doesn't do anything. For me to make it react, I need to heat it. I need to torch it. And then what happens is, well, you know, what happens when you heat particles? They become what? They move faster. And if they move fast enough and they collide fast enough, then you'll get a reaction in this case. Then the glucose and oxygen will react to give you carbon dioxide and water. Now, uh, if our body required the use of heat energy to get glucose to react with oxygen, it would kill us because it would require a lot of energy input. So without an enzyme, we would have to put a lot of energy in to make that reaction happen. Well, we don't do that. We use enzymes. And we're going to spend a whole chapter on how your body uses enzymes to get glucose to react with oxygen. So without enzymes, a lot less energy is required, which means the reaction can happen more quickly. Okay. Um, now, we talked about exergonic and endergonic reactions. And you'll see enzymes are involved in that. I'll show you another really important reaction, and then we're going to stop there. Uh, it's called a redox reaction. Okay? So again, this is a type of reaction. Enzymes highly involved in this reaction. This is a reaction where uh, one substance gives up 
electrons, but it's also electrons and protons. Therefore, something else must what? If something is giving them up, something else must be taking them. So a redox reaction is, well, it's actually made up of two words. The re it means reduction, and the ox is, so the, the R-E-D, the red would refer to reduction, and the, uh, the O-X is oxidation. And what that means is when something is being reduced, okay, if it's being reduced, it's gaining electrons and protons. If something is being oxidized, that means it's losing electrons and protons. So in this case here, see, uh, this is a reaction between methane and oxygen. Oxygen would get reduced, which means methane would be getting oxidized. Okay? Do you remember this molecule? Remember this molecule? Can I show you this? What does it look like to you? What kind of a nutrient does it look like to you? Do you recognize anything? Because you know, on your quiz, you're going to see, you know, recognize it. What is this? So, what, do you, what does this look like to you? What do you see in this picture? What's this? Sugar, phosphate, base. What is this? This is a modified what? It's a modified nucleotide. Okay? This nucleotide is being used to, uh, to carry electrons and protons. This is the oxidized version right over here. Okay. Uh, when it becomes reduced, it picks up, well, look, it's positively charged. Here, it's got a, an H. So what happens is it picks up two things. It picks up hydrogen, a proton, a hydrogen proton, and it picks up two electrons. So this molecule is reduced. This molecule is oxidized. And you'll see when we get to uh, respiration and photosynthesis, you'll see how enzymes will oxidize and reduce other molecules. Okay? Um, so why don't we stop there, and then tomorrow we'll talk more about enzymes themselves and actually how they work. Okay?